Good morning, afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Cecci Galanos. I am the executive manager of the World Stroke Academy, the education platform of the World Stroke Organization that provides stroke education to health professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that I am hosting this educational activity today on stroke in women with a panel of exceptional speakers who will be sharing their expertise on the topic. Now, before uh, introducing today's moderator and speakers, um, as per usual, we will have a look at some of our housekeeping rules for today. We welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel. You can, of course, use the chat box to say hi, leave your comments, and tell us where you are joining us from. We have also prepared some poll questions for you before each presentation, so make sure you place your vote. Also, this webinar is recorded and the recording link will be sent out to you via email shortly after the webinar, and it will also be uploaded on the World Stroke Academy site. Lastly, I kindly invite you to fill in the evaluation survey at the end, which will pop up on your screen to share your feedback with us and any additional questions you might have. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's moderator, Assistant Professor Zilko Zivanovic, who's head of the Clinic of Neurology, University Clinical Center of Vojvodina, Medical Faculty, University of Novi Sad. He's the president of the Serbian Stroke Organization, the national coordinator of the Stroke Action Plan for Europe, and he's also part of the Telestroke Committee of the European Stroke Organization. Thank you for being with us today, and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Laura. Dear audience, uh, welcome uh, from uh, today's uh, uh, welcome to today's webinar uh, from me also. I'm uh, honored and pleased to have been entrusted from World Stroke Academy to moderate today's webinar with uh, great lectures that await us. Uh, so we recently celebrated International Women's Day. So it's good time in that spirit to, to devote the upcoming stroke webinar to the topic of stroke in women. Uh, before start with lectures, uh, I'd like to take a few minutes to honor uh, a person uh, who has been part of the global stroke community uh, from uh, our this region in uh, Europe and who was an uh, extraordinary uh, woman in the uh, field of stroke. Uh, more than uh, a year has passed since the leading uh, specialist in neurology and neurosonology in Bulgaria, academician uh, Dr. Ekaterina Titianova left us. Uh, she was the head of the uh, functional diagnostics of the nervous system clinic at the uh, Military Medical Academy and the uh, head of the neurology department uh, at the Faculty of Medicine, uh, St. Clement uh, Ochlitsky University in Sofia. She was an academician of the Bulgarian Academy of uh, Sciences and uh, Arts and an academician of Serbian Royal Academy of Scientists and Artists. Uh, her scientific contribution is uh, enormous uh, in the field of cerebrovascular disease, neurosonology, uh, hemorrheology, gait control, uh, autonomic disorders, and neurorehabilitation. Uh, she was the winner of numerous uh, world uh, awards in the field of stroke. Uh, she will uh, forever uh, remain a uh, dear teacher, colleague, and friend. Uh, her colleagues uh, say that uh, she saved uh, lives with a smile and uh, was an uh, exemplary uh, doctor. She used to say, think positively and listen to folk wisdom. And it is our duty to respect and not forget uh, the personality and work of the academician Dr. Uh, Ekaterina Titianova. Thank you. So uh, I think we could start with the lectures now. Uh, it seems I'm not uh, going to turn out to be a gentleman now, uh, since I will first uh, introduce uh, men uh, as the first lecturer, of course. Uh, it's uh, my dear colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Hrvoje Budinčević. Hrvoje uh, Budinčević is uh, deputy uh, head of department uh, of neurology 
uh, and uh, head of uh, stroke and intensive care unit at uh, University Hospital Sveti Duh in uh, Zagreb and uh, assistant professor of neurology at uh, University uh, Strossmayer in uh, Osijek, Croatia. Uh, the topic of his lecture is uh, hypertension and stroke. Is there a sex or gender difference? Uh, Hrvoje, uh, before start, uh, we, we have a, a pool for, for uh, a question uh, uh, of which we uh, get uh, answer after lecture, but uh, now uh, I, I call our uh, audience to vote for the right question. And after lectures, we uh, know the, the right answer. Okay, start vote. Okay. Okay, we will see the right answer. Okay, Hervé, let's start. Uh, dear Jericho, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you for all from to organizers for inviting me to present this uh, lecture about hypertension and stroke and is there a gender or stroke uh, or sex difference. So this, these are the learning objectives. And as we know, hypertension is the leading cause of premature death uh, worldwide. That is independent factor for cardiovascular mortality uh, and morbidity. And it is estimated that only tw uh, about 20% of uh, people, adults, uh, have hy hypertension under control. And also it is estimated that a half of adults with hypertension are unaware that they are actually having hypertension. Uh, and the most of uh, hypertension uh, and this unregulated hypertension is present in low and middle income, income countries. When we look before, uh, that is regarding uh, cardiovascular disease burden, hypertension is still a leading, leading modifiable risk factor. And when we are looking at these sex and gender differences, we could see that the cardiovascular death is more common in uh, male or men. Uh, so what is about risk factors for arterial hypertension and stroke? These modifiable risk factors for hypertension and stroke are actually almost the same. And of course, they are including unhealthy diet, uh, physical inactivity, smoking, alcohol consumption, overweight, and other uh, topics. So why we need to reduce blood pressure? Uh, the reducing blood pressure, systolic blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury or and uh, diastolic blood pressure by five millimeters of mercury actually reduces risk uh, of stroke by 41% and the risk for myocardial infarction for 22% in primary prevention and 34% in secondary stroke prevention. And of course, the half, almost the half of all strokes are linked to arterial hypertension. Of course, we are having these guidelines about uh, stroke and arterial hypertension. Unfortunately, there are no these uh, sex or gender differences disclosed. So what are these sex and gender differences? What is sex, what is gender? So uh, sex describes male and female individuals and we are all born by, for, uh, by a female or uh, male. And that is biological and physio physiological characteristics, characteristics and the sex related facts may not be modified at all since there is related to chromosomal differences between males and females. And these sex uh, issues have similar uh, importance across different social cultural settings. On the other side, gender is uh, described characteristics of uh, 
uh, women and men that are socially constructed. That is learned behavior and uh, based on socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that are, is given by uh, society. And it may be modifiable without any pharmacological intervention, but in practice, the social cultural environment of the patients may not allow for these changes. And these social cultural factors may vary largely in different social cultural settings. So of course, we don't have uh, the, there are also lacking of data. And sometimes it is impossible to, distingu to distinguish whether the certain differences are related to sex or gender. When we are looking uh, about uh, these uh, gender or sex uh, differences in regulation of blood pressures, sex hormones are having important role. When we are looking what is uh, about prevalence of arterial hypertension in men and women, we, we may see that after menopause, there is an increase of number of blood, blood pressure uh, or arterial hypertension in women. So the loss of estrogen is probably not the only component involved in this high blood pressure in women after menopause. Of course, uh, hypertension, uh, the main, um, main controlling factor is related to renin angiotensin system. So in preclinical models of hypertension, we, we see that the male animals usually have higher blood pressure uh, in, in comparison to female animals. And this plasma renin activity is directly correlated to the testosterone levels. There are also differences between gender and race among uh, different population. And the prevalence of arterial hypertension is not uniform in terms of gender between uh, uh, regarding to the race and ethnicity. Uh, the role of sex hormones in arterial hypertension is important. Estrogens are uh, causing vasodilatation. Uh, they are causing also activation of NO uh, system, inhibition of uh, sympath sympathetics and uh, renin angiotensin system, and androgens uh, incre actually increasing angiotensin too, which is very important to development of arterial hypertension. On the other uh, side, the hem hemodynamic changes are also different in, in uh, male and female individuals. So there is also increased arterial stiffness and vascular resistance after menopause, which could cause, of course, of course some uh, changes in the heart, which indirectly causing and directly, of course, causing arterial hypertension. When we are, this is one, uh, one slide which is showing these differences be, uh, between sex differences in arterial hypertension. And we can see that the blood pressure is uh, mostly present in male individuals in, uh, in young and middle age. And as the uh, age uh, continues, the development of arterial hypertension is more common in women. Also, the hypertension is most mostly uh, associated with obesity, uh, pregnancy complication, polycystic ovary syndrome, autoimmune disorders, and air pollution is re more related with development of arterial hypertension in women and smoking, diabetes, and uh, sleep apnea, and of course, erectile dysfunction is uh, related to the hypertension in men. For example, regarding these heart changes in a woman, we, we, we could find a more common left ventricular hyper, hypertrophy and left arterial dilatation in a woman. And in men, we, also, we could have this large uh, left ventricular dilatation and more common, this cardiovascular calcifications. Uh, also, women have more adverse events uh, and uh, less drug adherence. On the other side, uh, the, as this article sa says, the men uh, have better blood, blood pressure control and 
sexual dysfunction is more most common uh, complication of these medications. When we are going, uh, we, are, we are speaking about uh, treatment of arterial hypertension in women. We may say that diuretic, diuretics are most often prescribed in women. And that is, of course, useful for reducing calcium excretion that is very good for this osteoporosis. Calcium, calcium channel blockers are more prescribed than EC inhibitors in stroke prevention. And EC inhibitors are generally uh, contraindicated in, uh, during pregnancy. And uh, of course, women, are, as I previously said, have increased risk of adverse events, and a reduced clinical response due to lower glomerular filtration rate, lower volume of distribution, and different activity of metabolic enzymes. And side effects are, are more, more common, and they are more prone to cough when they are treated with ACE inhibitors, and they are more susceptible to vasodilatation-related adverse events by uh, calcium channel blockers. Uh, stroke in women is a growing public health problem. Uh, it is a fourth leading cause of death in women aged between 20 and 59 years. According to current estimates, women account for about 60% of all stroke deaths. And in the, the stroke is in, uh, the second leading cause of death among women over 60 years of age. And of course, uh, also uh, women have higher prevalence and frequency of intracranial aneurysms and significantly higher incidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage compared to men, while men having higher rate of hemorrhagic stroke. So risk factors uh, in women are, um, there are differences and more common in women. Also the strength of these uh, risk factors are uh, higher. And also uh, there are also sex specific risk factors in women. When we are talking about di diagnosis the, in women, we usually uh, complete uh, the evaluation is not so comprehensive as in men. Uh, on the other side, uh, they are more likely diagnosed with stroke mimics, but actually when, when you are looking at other, uh, this uh, publication, actually stroke mimics is sometimes in stroke uh, uh, issues more common in men. On the other side, uh, regarding treatment, uh, women less likely give, uh, is given uh, RTPA, but more likely they are given uh, thrombectomy and they are for sure, under representation of women in trials. The, as it, it was previously said, there are a larger number of deaths per year and higher disability after stroke. And stroke is more likely to be uh, the first manifestation of cardiovascular disease in women, whereas in men, coronary heart disease is more common. As I previously said, there are so, some specific uh, factors which are related to as a uh, relating to pre pregnancy uh, issues and the, the me uh, menopause and parity and uh, regarding risk factors diabetes is more common hypertension obesity atrial fibrillation and migraine pitora a physical uh, interestingly physical activities uh, as a risk factor is similar when are Looking this as a biological factors like a sex and social cultural factors as a gender, we, we could say that the women are all five, five years older when they have stroke, but they are having higher pre-stroke disability. More, there is more common uh, atrial fibrillation and there is a stronger association with obesity and smoking and the risk with are there, uh, there is a higher risk for stroke with uh, hypertension after controlling for antihypertensives. And also there are uh, risk, the higher risk with uh, these unique hormonal factors. And from the gender side, uh, there is also higher risk uh, with a uh, 
lower socioeconomic status in women, and women are more likely to be alone or widowed at the time uh, when they got uh, stroke. Uh, uh, when we are looking at the severity of stroke, uh, stroke is uh, in uh, women are, they are having severe stroke, more severe stroke than men with higher NIH stroke scale, and also uh, they are having higher modified ranking score at discharge. And, but in, in the stroke treatment, in this uh, analysis, there were no difference in stroke treatments during hospitalization. Uh, this match analysis showed that the higher risk for ischemic strokes is related to hypertension during pregnancy. The risk for hemorrhagic stroke is high and related to gestational hypertension and late menopause. And the high risk for any stroke is present uh, in the hypertension during pregnancy, preterm delivery, stillbirth. And this, this uh, meta-analysis systemic uh, review showed that hysterectomy could be possibly pro protective against any stroke. And from the male side, from the men's side, uh, the high risk for any stroke is related to erectile dysfunction and the risk for ischemic stroke is higher in, a, in the patients which receive medical androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, what is with uh, stroke and pregnancy? The incidence is uh, 30 per 100, and when, with preeclampsia, it is one uh, per uh, 500 pregnancies. And up to there is uh, up to five, 15 times higher risk for uh, hypertension uh, for stroke with hypertension in a pregnancy with migraine and causes. We will see next uh, lectures. It could be caused by um, cardioembolism dissection, uh, hemorrhage, of course, with central venous thrombosis and vasospasm uh, syndrome. And uh, the pathophysiology is related to cardiac remodeling, systemic vasodilatation, hypercoagulability, and immunomodulation, dysregulation with endothelial dysfunction. When we are looking who is receiving these uh, uh, reperfusional therapies, uh, this thrombolysis. For example, men with previous history of stroke, hypertension, and higher NIH stroke are more likely to be excluded for, for the treatment with thrombolysis. And when we, we are looking at these uh, cases with incidental, uh, uh, with the incident of hypertension, female with increased age, higher NIH stroke scale, previous stroke diabetes, or and higher INR is more likely to be excluded for the, for the thrombolysis. Uh, what is with the registry? The registry also confirmed that the women have more antihypertensive therapy and hypertension uh, in medical uh, history. And there is also this, this meta-analysis show there is also uh, a difference in diagnostics and treatment uh, between genders. And for example, uh, women not significantly see more harder ECGs, but other diagnostic uh, modalities are more, more commonly uh, the, doing in men uh, as well with the treatment, more TPA is present, more statins, warfarin and antiplatelets are given to men, and the AC inhibitors didn't show this significant difference in warfarin. And what is about knowledge? Uh, this is a one, um, one, one article regarding this knowledge and about hypertension and education in a hospitalized patient with stroke in Vienna, and that they sh show that the knowledge was insufficient and partially associated with educational level. And of course, there is a room for, for improving that through the campaigns. And in the conclusion, I could say that hypertension is still the most common risk factor in cardiovascular disease burden. Sex hormones play uh, plays impor important role in arterial hy hypertension. And there are uh, several specific differences in sex and gender issues in arterial hypertension and stroke, and sex and gender uh, should be 
clearly explained in the research for take away message, uh, we should be aware about sex and stroke difference in management of stroke in arterial hypertension. And we, we should try to clearly define these terms, especially in our uh, research. So thank you. Thank you very much. Is it is it a time for another poll or we are going further? It is time for another poll before Dr. Tu presents the presentation. So we'll go ahead and launch it. Oh, that's it. that is another poll for Christina. So please select which are risk factors for CVT in pregnancy. This is a multiple choice type of question. Should I start? Perfect. We will now end the poll and show you the results from our audience. Okay, yes. and then, all right. <laughs> all right. Hope to change that. Okay. Perfect. So uh, sorry. Uh, okay, I have to go. Oh, something is a little bit wrong. I have to okay, go. thank you, Hruya, okay. for excellent lecture. The next lecture uh, on the topic of uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in pregnancy and uh, poor caring <clears throat> will be held by uh, Dr. Christina Tiu. Uh, she's associate professor at University of Medicine and Pharmacy, uh, Carol Davila in uh, Bucharest, uh, and uh, head of stroke unit at the University Hospital in Bucharest, Romania. Dear professor, please. Okay. That thank, lecture. You, thank you very much, Dr. Ivanovich. Um, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me. I will uh, try to lead you a little bit through the problem of cerebral venous uh, sinus thrombosis in pregnancy in puerperium. So, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis, uh, it's usually considered uh, a rare um, type of stroke. It uh, counts in general population between uh, 0.5 and 1% of all stroke. And it is estimated that the global annual incidence is at five per 1 million people years. Uh, but women experience three times the incidence of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. I, I will just shorten it to CVT uh, as compared to men. So we reach uh, an incidence of uh, 10, 12 uh, per million people per year. Um, well, why do we talk about this? Because this, uh, of course, can result as any type of stroke in long-term neurological deficiency. What we can say that the last um, well, years, um, even decades, uh, the mortality has improved constantly. It was one of the important uh, causes for um, maternal mort mortality or in the puerperal uh, period uh, interval. So uh, now the mortality has decreased to less than 50%, 15% uh, and um, in hospital is uh, less than 6% with uh, 30 days mortalities of 4% or less. Why uh, do we have uh, this problem? General uh, risk factors for uh, CBT uh, account for um, uh, prescription drugs per uh, pregnancy and puerperium, uh, the tobacco use, uh, different mechanical precipitants like trauma, or sometimes we had some cases of uh, cerebral venous thrombosis after uh, lumbar puncture with uh, uh, hypotension, uh, intracranial syndrome, different hematological condition, inflammatory diseases or other disorders. If we look at this, uh, the most frequent are prescription drugs in pregnancy and puerperium. And here uh, for the drugs, we, uh, there are a lot, but also um, contraceptive. And um, so this is why up to 75% of CVT are uh, in adults are in women due to this use of oral contraceptives of uh, pregnancy or the postpartum period. 
So when we talk about maternal strokes during pregnancy, venous strokes represent between six and 64% of all strokes. It's a huge difference, but it accounts for, uh, I think differences also in um, uh, economic conditions and uh, the type of healthcare in different parts of the world. Uh, the greater uh, risk period, the greatest risk period for CVT include the third trimester and the first six weeks postpartum. A study that was uh, called the conception study, and it was a nationwide study, uh, which was um, done in France, uh, looked uh, to the incidence by types of strokes for different pregnancy periods. And they uh, took into account uh, um, a period of time. Uh, they looked back and they um, analyzed um, more than 6 million people, uh, actually women aged between 15 and 49 years uh, with no history of stroke. And uh, then they uh, followed prospectively and uh, they found that uh, 1,200 experienced the first ever stroke either antepartum, peripartum, or the first six weeks postpartum. And the incidence was 24 per 100,000 person years. Uh, they looked to the regions of France and at the first uh, glance, they had differences with uh, higher incidence in certain regions. Uh, but after a uh, multivariate and adjusted incidence rate, just the overseas department where, as I, uh, suppose the uh, economical conditions and the healthcare is not as good as in uh, the continental France, uh, the, the incidents uh, were higher. They also looked uh, at the percentage of stroke by type, and uh, we now can see that uh, it's a different percentage that we see uh, in adults usually, uh, because we are used to have 85% or so uh, of ischemic stroke and less hemorrhage, but here uh, it's almost 50-50, and we have a high incidence, a higher incidence of uh, CVT. Uh, when they looked <clears throat> to the uh, stroke incidence trend between and, uh, uh, 2010 and uh, 2018, they uh, mm, saw that there is a higher and uh, an increasing incidence of ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke, and the incidence of CVT was stable, but uh, there is a considerably higher than ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke uh, in uh, pregnant uh, women versus non-pregnant women. So um, if we look to other uh, papers, uh, well, uh, I, I can say that uh, I found a lot of uh, literature published in the last year on this subject. Uh, so this was a study which was uh, led by Jonathan Coutinho. Uh, they looked at the data from five uh, cerebral venous thrombosis registries. And uh, there is, uh, this is a case control study, one of the, the few case control studies. Uh, the controls were <coughs> uh, people who uh, were, um, so they, they had the controls. Uh, they looked at the um, mega Dutch uh, database where uh, people with risk factors for venous thrombosis were registered. And um, so they took the poses uh, of uh, these people <laughs> as control uh, cases, and then the people with cerebral venous thrombosis, uh, of course, uh, the cases they followed. Um, they mm, excluded men. They excluded men, or uh, women are over 50 years old. Uh, those who were uh, using contraceptives uh, or hormonal replacement therapy, those who had a recent miscarriage or those who did not have any data about uh, if they had or not a recent pregnancy. And in, uh, at the end, they had 163 cases and 1,230 controls. Cases were younger with a median uh, age of 38 years versus 41 and had a more history of cancer or venous thrombosis. And uh, from this, 25% uh, uh, from the cases uh, were pregnant or postpartum, and only 7% of, uh, of uh, control. 
And uh, the conclusion was that um, pregnant or postpartum women have a, uh, a three uh, times 0.5 uh, fold, uh, fold uh, of higher incidence of uh, CVT. And in the postpartum period, this increases of tenfold. And uh, the, the most uh, dangerous uh, and risky period is uh, the first six weeks postpartum. Another study who was uh, in the United States uh, conducted uh, in 17 states of the United States followed 100, uh, 1 million and 400,000 people, uh, actually sampled deliveries. And uh, there were 183 of peripartum stroke. And of these, 170, so a, a huge percentage, uh, was of peripartum intracranial venous thrombosis. They looked at the multivariate analysis to look for significant associations with both peripartum and postpartum stroke. And they found that uh, the significant association was with age, excessive vomiting, with dehydration, uh, hypertension, infections, and caesarean delivery. Why do we have this problem in pregnancy and puerperium? Uh, these are uh, time intervals which are associated with several physiological changes that increase the risk of thrombotic stroke. And it regards coagulation factor set changes, connective tissue changes, increasing venous compliance, cardiac and hemodynamic changes, and also immunological and inflammatory changes which modulate endothelial cell function. If we look at these two arrows, we see that some uh, increase like blood volume, plasma volume, red blood cell volume, white blood cell count, and there is increased hemodilution, and uh, there is an increased um, capacity of blood to carry oxygen. Uh, there is an increase in hem hemoglobin mass, and all clotting factors increase, excepting uh, factor 11 and 13. Also, there is inflammatory reaction with increased C-reactive protein, increased complements is 3 and 3,4, and uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. On the other side, we have a decreased viscosity of blood, decrease, decrease of platelet count, of plasma protein concentration, of serum albumin, and that there is a decrease in fibrinolytic activity. Also, decrease in anticoagulant activity. So, in Actually, in the third trimester and the early puerperium, we have an anticoagulant decrease, we have a hypercoagulation state, we have increased venous status because we have a, uh, increased venous capacitance and there is uh, distended veins, and there is obstruction due to uh, the uterus, uh, uh, which is enlarged. Uh, and also some, uh, we can have vascular damage related to vaginal or caesarean section delivery which creates the greatest hypercoagulability during the early puerperium. What is happening? So you have a cortical or a sinus thrombosis, and then you will have increased venular and capillary pressure. This will lead first to dilation of collateral veins, and then to blood uh, brain barrier disruption, and secondary to this vasogenic edema, both of these leading to the hemorrhagic infarction and parenchymal hemorrhage. But uh, when this dilation of collateral veins is exhausted, it will follow, be followed by a decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure and blood flow. And in the end, you'll have also failure of energetic metabolism with changes um, of the uh, membrane activity and uh, sodium potassium pump, and finally cytotoxic edema. So we will have both type of edema in uh, cerebral hemorrhage. How do, when do we think of cerebral venous thrombosis in pregnant or postpartum uh, women? Uh, of course, headache is a prominent feature. Uh, feature. We have signs of intracranial hypertension. We can have focal neurological abnormalities, and also we can see uh, hemorrhagic infarction. Uh, a study um, which looked at um, the, uh, a systematic review of uh, cerebral venous thrombosis clinical signs and uh, uh, it was uh, um, led in uh, by the others, between others by uh, Tudor Jovin, with, uh, which is a well-known uh, scientist and is, uh, he's uh, Romanian. Uh, so the, uh, the more than 70% of people had a headache and the clot location was mainly in the superior sagittal uh, sinus. 
And we, uh, of course, we all know that the clinical signs will vary according to the sinuses that are affected. And um, the clinical signs include, um, besides headache, uh, can include uh, the six cranial nerve palsy due to the intracranial hypertension. We can have papular edema, um, brain edema. We can have hemorrhagic infarction and uh, intracranial hypertension. And of course, we can have seizures. How can we diagnose uh, uh, this? Well, normally it uh, is uh, easy and in every person coming to the ER with a seizure or a headache or, uh, of course, with a neurological deficit, we will immediately prescribe um, neuro um, imaging. But uh, what about a pregnant woman? Well, uh, if we think about MRI, uh, we prefer to uh, have a 1.5 Tesla. Uh, unless there, it will be a clear benefit from three Tesla. It's not completely forbidden, but it's, we, we recommend 1.5 Tesla. Usage of gadolinium on the other side, uh, gadolinium-based contrast substance is not recommended because it is associated with an increased risk of premature birth, neonatal deaths, rheumatological and inflammatory diseases in the uh, newborn. So um, if it is absolutely necessary, if you do not have other means, it can be administered, but uh, only if it really uh, brings significant information for diagnosis uh, regarding the uh, CT, a non-contrast CT, and also uh, there is for the ionizing radiation can have mutagenic and carcinogenic effects, but the risk is greater in the first 16 weeks. And we saw that uh, the risk of uh, CVT is greater in the third trimester in the purpural uh, period. But um, even if in the first 16 weeks, in practice, if you have an irradiation below uh, 50 milligrays, there is no risk at any gestational age. And one head or neck CT uh, brings the fetal exposure dose to one or 10, uh, up to 10 milligrays. So there is no risk for CT. Uh, so it's a little bit counterintuitive. We are used to, to seeing that CT is more dangerous than MRI, but it seems it's in, in pregnant women, at least at the first trimester is a little bit uh, uh, different. And there is no risk. There are no uh, communicated uh, uh, papers of the risk of uh, contrast substance. What can we see? We can look for the clot. and um, the aspect of the thrombus can vary according to the age of thrombosis. Uh, if it's recent thrombus or uh, uh, an older one, subacute sub thrombosis, especially that usually uh, um, CVT comes uh, in a subacute sub presentation uh, most often. And uh, MRR venography using time of flight avoids the usage of the contra substance, but has higher false positive results. And we must be uh, cautious because sometimes there is a symmetry of the uh, venous sinuses. When we look about, uh, when we speak about CT, for the non-contrast uh, uh, CT, we can see hyperdense uh, sinus or vein, the cord sign uh, or from thrombosic, uh, thrombosis of a cortical vein or the dense triangle sign. And if we uh, administer the contrast, substance, we can see the empty delta sign in the posterior part of the superior sagittal sinus. We can also see the hemorrhagic infarction, which are areas of hemorrhagic infarction, but we, which do not respect an arterial territory. How about the treatment? We have the ESO guidelines, um, which was uh, elaborated mainly by Professor Jose Ferro, who was uh, uh, a great part of his life concerned about uh, cerebral venous thrombosis. And uh, the treatment of choice is anticoagulant therapy. The drug regimen is different during pregnancy and where period. And uh, <clears throat> we have here a table from the, um, oh, okay, I think I lost one slide. All right, so if we look to uh, the warfarin, uh, this crosses the placenta, so it is uh, uh, in, involved in embryopathies, and mainly in the first trimester, but uh, 
uh, it is uh, not, uh, it is uh, marked with X category. And the other low molecular weight heparin, unfractioned heparin and different types of uh, uh, heparins um, can be administered. And uh, <clears throat> regarding the transfer to breast milk, uh, yes, uh, warfarin uh, passes to the uh, breast milk. So um, if uh, no other choice, it can be used, but again, it's not uh, completely recommended. What about direct anticoagulants? Well, we know that uh, there are, uh, the, it was recently um, published, uh, a uh, study which was, was called Action CVC, and the results uh, were that uh, there was a similar rec recurrence venous thrombosis risk and similar death risk and similar partial or complete recanalization, and there was a lower hemorrhage with Zulux, but this was not in pregnant women. So um, here are some other um, studies uh, who follow the um, efficacy of DUAX in CVT, but again, not in pregnant women. Some of them uh, will look, uh, uh, will, will uh, probably be published soon. Uh, we have this um, scientific report, uh, which was published in 2019. It was uh, uh, the result from a, a database, which was called VigiBase, and the result was clear. Uh, drugs are not recommended in pregnancy and postpartum breastfeeding women. And um, here is another um, uh, register, a real life uh, register, uh, following this time uh, people with all kinds of venous thrombosis. And we see that uh, in uh, pregnancy associated thrombosis here, the drug uh, well have been uh, used, but again, we uh, keep in mind that this is for all kinds of thrombosis. So in pregnancy, we recommend the, the ESO guidelines and we, we do like this, uh, we recommend uh, uh, low molecular weighted heparin or unfractioned heparin, but uh, be aware of the risk of thrombocytopenia. Um, and in puerperium, if the woman is breastfeeding, Again, low molecular weighted heparin or unfractioned heparin. This is very difficult to, to use in the uh, outside the hospital. So for a longer time, we will use low molecular weighted heparin. And sometimes, if no other choice, we can use warfarin. And if the woman in the puerperium or postpartum period is not breastfeeding, we can use uh, uh, all the, the others plus uh, the DUAX. What we'll do if the patient is not responding to anticoagulation therapy and is experiencing neurological deficits. So we can think in, uh, in hospital, if you have a severe cases with an aggravating uh, <clears throat> uh, neurological status with coma and so on, or uh, we can use, we can think about uh, infusing the uh, 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 FTPA or streptokinase uh, in the dural uh, sinus via, via microcatheter. But we also have to keep in mind that two acts study will, did not show a significant benefit from endovascular treatment in severe CVT. How long we must continue? There is no precise duration for long-term systemic anticoagulation. Of course, if we find some associated thrombophilia, we should continue uh, for a longer time or sometimes lifelong uh, anticoagulation. But usually, if it, we do not find it very of significant hematological disorder, uh, we should continue at least for six weeks, but usually we do this for three months. Um, if uh, there, we have to management the delivery options and we have to discontinuate anticoagulants prior to induction of labor or caesarean section, um, we should uh, have to take this decision in a multidisciplinary team and follow the available obstetric guidelines. And usually um, lower molecular he uh, weighted heparin is uh, suspended 12 and 20, uh, between 12 and 24 hours before delivery. What about future pregnancies? Well, the guidelines say that the medical history of uh, cerebral venous thrombosis should not be assumed as a contraindication for future pregnancies. Of course, there is a higher risk of developing 
uh, a new uh, cerebral venous thrombosis, but usually this happens um, quite rare. And um, if the patient is followed uh, for the future pregnancy in a tertiary stroke setting or uh, uh, receives prophylaxy with low molecular weighted heparin, uh, which is recommended, uh, the outcome will be favorable. And usually there is no spontaneous abortion or uh, something uh, related to uh, a negative effect of the antithrombotic uh, prophylaxy with heparin, uh, even in the first trimester. And with this, I leave you with an image of my hospital and I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Tio, for a great presentation. Uh, the last lecture for today is uh, Dr. Uh, Cheryl Bushnell. Uh, she's professor of neurology at uh, Wake Forest Baptist Health and uh, director of its uh, Comprehensive Stroke Center in Winston Salem, North Carolina, USA. Uh, professor Bushnell has more than twenty uh, years of uh, expertise uh, on stroke uh, risk unique to women, as well as six uh, differences. Uh, the topic of uh, her lecture is uh, the role of menopause and hormonal therapy uh, in stroke risk in uh, women. Dear Professor, if you're ready, please begin. Before we go ahead and get started, I will just make sure to launch the poll that she has prepared for us. Yes, of course, actually. And in this one, we ask you, for each, of the, for each of the women below, is it appropriate to prescribe hormone replacement therapy? For the sake of time, we will be ending the poll now. And these are the results from our audience. We can go ahead and get started. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. All right, well, it's a pleasure to join this um, illustrious group of speakers and, and the World Stroke Academy for just like to thank them for doing a, a focused uh, webinar on stroke and women. I'm going to talk about the role of menopause and hormone therapy in stroke risk in women. These are my disclosures. And I'm going to talk about menopause, the reproductive lifespan, and stroke risk, as well as hormone replacement, endometriosis, and surgical menopause uh, in relationship to stroke risk. And this is from some very recent data that's come out in the last six months or so that's really, I think, useful for how to talk to your female patients about their risk of stroke. So menopause and reproductive lifespan are really uh, important. And so there are a lot of cardiovascular changes that occur um, that, that uh, really soon after the menopausal transition, even during. And so this includes dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, fat redistribution, and systemic hypertension. And so all of those things can sort of help accelerate atherosclerosis um, from plaque initiation to your plaque progression. Um, and then this is a uh, lovely um, sort of flow diagram about all of the potential pathophysiological processes that occur within and outside of menopause. Um, so we know that there can be an increase in oxidative stress, increase in collagen and intimal medial thickness, an increase in endothelial dysfunction, which can then impact the heart uh, in terms of left ventricular hypertrophy, and also obviously um, cerebral vascular dysfunction in this relationship to small vessels of use as one example. Um, but then you're really kind of um, looking at an increase in subclinical coronary disease or um, cerebrovascular disease that's associated with cardiovascular aging. And those other risk factors that I mentioned in the previous slide are all relevant here, including hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. 
But then when you add on tobacco abuse, obesity, and sleep apnea, you're looking at a, a pretty um, you know, wide variety of processes that can increase cardiovascular aging um, in addition to menopause. And so, now, before yes. I am sorry for interrupting. We are receiving some comments about the sound. May I ask you to perhaps keep the mic closer um, from the headphones, hoping this will help? Uh, is this better? I think so, yes. Okay, uh, hopefully, just please let me know. Stop me anytime if this is not. Um, there is some, um, some background noise. Uh, we can hear you well, but at some moments there is some sound in the back. Let, let's give it a try like this. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so the age of menopause is one factor that can increase the risk of uh, ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. And this was shown in the European Prospective Investigation of Cancer and Nutrition in the Netherlands. And in this particular cohort, the women had a mean age of menopause of about 46 years old. And uh, when they looked at the women who had menopause that occurred before age 40, there was a 1.48 fold increased hazard of total stroke, which was primarily driven, driven by ischemic stroke compared to women who had menopause in you know, the age range of 50 to 54. So earlier age of menopause leads to uh, probable increased risk of stroke. And then they looked at um, another kind of linear analysis and found that 2% Lower, there was a 2% lower stroke risk for each year menopause goes to your age. Um, so a later menopause is likely better. And look at this another way, reproductive lifespan um, or RLS is defined as the difference in age between for the years between menarche onset and menopause. And so the longer time you have between menarche and menopause, um, the lower your risk, and the shorter um, reproductive lifespan is associated with uh, at least a 30% increased risk of stroke in uh, in this particular systematic systematic review. So some of the key caveats to this is that um, it's really really difficult to account for all estrogen exposure throughout a woman's entire lifetime. So that has to include pregnancy, the number of pregnancies, bleed, breastfeeding. Um, stillbirths and miscarriages, use of oral contraceptives, um, menopausal hormone therapy, and, and how do you account for all of these different estrogen exposures when you're calculating this overall reproductive lifespan? And so further research is needed with systematic measurement of this estrogen exposure, and to do these studies prospectively, that will help us understand this better. So hormone replacement, also very important, and what I and really impressed by is that there's continuing to be more and more data um, that is being published about this and, and more and more people are studying it. And I think it's um, important that we don't just rest on the results of the Women's Health Initiative, for example, um, and we're looking at it uh, in, in different cohorts. So the UK Biobank study um, had a, over 250,000 women in their cohort. And what they did that was really um, unique is they used time varying variables in their cost regression analyses and uh, in calculating stroke risk over time. And what they found is uh, for women who are using hormone therapy, compared to non users, there was an increased risk of any stroke. Ischemic stroke, not really uh, significantly increased, no impact on hemorrhage. But it was subarachnoid hemorrhage that really drove the uh, the stroke um, increased risk. And so this was an, a, a new finding that has not been commonly published. And I think is going to lead to a lot more uh, discussion because we know that subarachnoid hemorrhage is more common in women and that it is um, aneurysms can be influenced by estrogen. So something else that we need to do. Uh, start looking at in, uh, in future studies. And then the time varying analyses were really key here too, because you can see that not only with the oral contraceptives, but also hormone replacement therapy, it's really the first year of use where you see the uh, increased risk. And theoretically, that would be because of the increased uh, probiotic nature of these medications. 
Um, whereas with oral contraceptives, you really didn't see much beyond the first year, whereas um, hormone therapy, um, if you continue to use it or if you've been a previous user, there seems to be a persistent increase. Um, and then looking at it another way, different systematic review, comparing randomized controlled trials with observational studies, um, you can see that there is a small increased risk of stroke, about 14%, still statistically significant in the randomized controlled trials, but uh, really no effect whatsoever in observational studies. And I think this is uh, something that has been um, on the minds of many uh, practitioners and epidemiologists over the years kind of figure out what is the major difference between these observational and randomized studies that shows a differential risk. And so another uh, systematic review um, showed that um, there was uh, a lot of differences in relationship to the uh, timing of initiation. So how old was a woman when she started using HRT? That's really important. How, what was the timing in relationship to menopause? Um, what was the underlying disease that they might have? Did they have hypertension, uh, diabetes, obesity, um, hypertrophia? And then the type of regimen is really important. How much estrogen progesterone uh, dosing is used? And then the route of administration, whether it's transdermal or oral, um, makes a difference. And a different um, systematic review published a year earlier uh, was basically saying that, you know, low dose oral transdermal hormone therapy, it appears to be safe within the first 10 years of menopause based on uh, the similar uh, studies as in the previous analyses. <clears throat> but the general recommendation is to use hormone therapy for the shortest amount of time possible if a woman is over age 60. And so to conclude about hormone therapy use, um, it's associated with an increased risk of stroke, regardless of timing or duration. And it's mostly it's, uh, related to ischemic and subarachnoid hemorrhage types. And um, this, this relationship here requires more study and that the risk of benefits of hom menopausal hormone therapy almost entirely depend on the characteristics of a woman in treating. And we also need, and this is by, um, editorial comment, we need more geographically and ethically diverse uh, populations to study in terms of hormone therapy use. Um, I don't think that there have been a lot of studies outside of Europe and North America. So the last topic we'll cover is endometriosis. And um, this is a relatively um, recent kind of um, uh, risk factor that has been identified in some recent literature. Um, but endometriosis is the existence of an extrauterine endometrium-like tissue that occurs in about 10% of reproductive age women. But you have to have a, a biopsy-proven diagnosis in order to know for sure that it's endometriosis. Um, it is an inflammatory process. There are pro-inflammatory mediators that infiltrate the peritoneal microenvironment. And this can lead to the clinical symptoms and the ovarian dysfunction that occurs with endometriosis. And the treatment is often hysterectomy. And so the question is whether this has been linked to um, stroke. And so in this study from the Nurses Health Study 2, um, they looked at uh, laparoscopically confirmed endometriosis and found that for women who did have endometriosis, there was a 34% increased risk of stroke in the adjusted model. Um, but they also looked at um, mediators, really important mediators like the hysterectomy and vulvarectomy that might have been done to actually treat the um, endometriosis itself. And you can see that that's a highly um, statistically significant mediator. 39% of the effect is basically explained by the, um, the hysterectomy and vulvarectomy that was done to treat it. And then a different study that's looking primarily at hysterectomy and ovarectomy was published in uh, 2022 in stroke. And this was from the China Kadori Biobank cohort. And they had about 280,000 80,000 women who were followed for nearly 10 years. Um, about over 8,000 had hysterectomy and uh, over 1,300 had hysterectomy and bilateral ovarectomy. 
And what they found is that there was a 9% increased risk of cardiovascular disease with hysterectomy alone, and a 6% increased risk of stroke. And this was statistically significant, um, even though these percentages are somewhat small. But when you add on uh, bilateral oophorectomy, you clearly have um, a, a more significant increased risk at 19% for cardiovascular disease and 20% for um, ischemic stroke. And so why would you even have any risk of hysterectomy? It's just pulling, you're leaving the ovaries. Why would that be a problem? Well, you actually have ovarian function that is altered after um, a hysterectomy, leading to probably an early menopause because you are um, impairing blood supply to the ovaries. So the risk is primarily for women who are under age 48 who may have been premenopausal at the time that they had their hysterectomy. I think this is an, a, another important thing. It's not just uh, that they had a hysterectomy done, it's what age were the women when they had it. So to summarize uh, this talk, um, women have unique risk factors that should be screened for. And adding to the list of that we pretty much already know, I think we should add endometriosis, whether they've had a hysterectomy, surgical, um, you know, for, for endometriosis or any other cause uh, with or without ovarian um, uh, retainment. And then oral contraceptive and hormone therapy use before pregnancy complications. And then age men at menopause before 40 and shorter reproductive lifespan increase the risk of stroke of women. And the risks and benefits of hormone therapy, obviously, are you have to take into account the characteristics of the women that you're going to treat. And endometriosis, as I mentioned, is a relatively new um, risk factor for stroking women, but maybe mediated more for hysterectomy. And that we need to account for screening for women who've had hysterectomy alone as a potential contribution to um, risk of stroke. And so I um, and uh, uh, happy to take questions. I apologize that we are over time, but happy to stay on um, for a few more minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolfner. Uh, we received a lot of comments about the sound quality. So uh, once again, we apologize for this uh, for this issue and it will be fixed in the webinar recording. So hopefully you got to uh, understand the, the main concepts and the slides will also be shared with you. We can now uh, move on to the Q&A section of the webinar. Professor Zivanovic. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we really uh, appreciate uh, everything we've heard and learned today. I'm sure that all of the listeners enjoyed the lectures and uh, that uh, we already have uh, plenty of questions for, for discussion. Uh, also, I apologize for little noise for last lecture. And uh, we can start with question if we agree. Uh, we receive uh, many questions for, for, from anonymous attended. Okay, however, the first uh, question is, can we uh, practice a thrombolysis for a pregnant woman with ischemic stroke? Uh, so it may be not uh, lecture specific, and if you agree, uh, I can answer. That uh, say that currently there are no uh, randomized control uh, trials uh, on the use of uh, acute uh, stroke treatment in general within uh, IVT, especially in pregnant women. And uh, uh, available data do not allow a uh, specific recommendation on, uh, on IVT in pregnant women with uh, acute ischemic stroke. But but uh, majority of experts suggest that uh, pregnant women with the, the acute uh, disabling uh, ischemic stroke uh, who meet uh, eligibility criteria can be treated with IVT after uh, assessing of uh, risk benefit uh, profile on an uh, individual basis. And also uh, in case of, of a large vessel occlusion and uh, if uh, uh, mechanical thrombectomy is available, uh, it could be preferred alone uh, over uh, bridging with, with the IVT. It's uh, expert uh, suggestions. Okay, maybe somebody else can 
discuss something on this team. Or we... For the sake of time, we should move to the next question. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. We received questions for for uh, Professor Christina to you. Uh, for uh, pregnant women uh, having a cerebral and venous thrombosis, uh, uh, should we practice an uh, exhaustive exploration to identify uh, etiology of thrombosis? Well, <laughs> during uh, pregnancy, we will uh, look, of course, uh, uh, limiting the, the invasive um, investigations, but we will have to look for infections because it, it can be just pregnancy, but you can also have an associated infection. I think it's no use of looking for uh, thrombophilia during pregnancy, but this can be kept in mind and continued after birth uh, of the child. Um, Unfortunately, sometimes you find a cancer and it's a dramatic situation. But uh, so you, I would look for um, big things that will uh, change the prognosis and the treatment. Uh, and then I will continue exploring uh, after the birth. Okay. Thank you. And maybe another interesting question. If a, per a person already had a CVT during pregnancy or per period, would you advise against uh, the use uh, oral contraceptives? Well, we, we heard that oral contraceptives, uh, uh, contraceptives increase the risk of CVT and risk of stroke. Uh, but um, despite this, the ESO guidelines do not advise uh, not to use. So um, the recommendation is to uh, inform uh, the person. So um, just be uh, aware that the, the risk is increased, but they do not uh, advise against using oral contraception. Okay, thank you. There is some question also for, for uh, Professor Bushnell. Uh, Please uh, comment for a second. Uh, please comment uh, on uh, OCP's uh, content, estrogen versus progesterone versus combined, uh, and the risk for stroke in young and uh, hormone replacement treatment content and risk for stroke. Yeah, that, that's a little bit beyond my uh, topic, um, I, I was trying to focus on hormone therapy, um, but in general, it's the estrogen content and the estrogen dose that increases the risk of stroke. And um, progesterone has not been shown, especially progesterone only, pills have not been shown to increase the risk. Thank you. And also, uh... Any comment about uh, estrogen formulations, such as use of uh, bioidenticals uh, and stroke risk? And, and that's an excellent question, but um, there really is not any recent study uh, focused on bioidenticals <clears throat> that I could find um, for um, that specifically focused on stroke risk. Um, so it sounds like something that probably should be studied further. Um, and perhaps some of those large cohort studies would have some information about women using bioidenticals. I think we just need to dig a little bit deeper to find, find the answer to that question. Okay, and we also have an interesting question for you. Uh, do we know uh, the risk of stroke, CVD? Uh, in transgender uh, patients, particularly those uh, who age and, uh, and have been on estrogen therapy for some time. And that's a highly um, relevant, um, timely question that uh, unfortunately, I don't think there is enough information out there, um, but, but again, something else that really needs to be studied. I, I know there are some people who are actively looking at that. Um, that issue right now. So it's a great question. I wish I had more information. Thank you very much. And then also uh, have a question for, for uh, 
Professor Budinchevich. Uh, the, the, we already heard that hormone replacement therapy does not reduce the uh, risk of ischemic stroke, and some studies show that uh, it even increases it. And however, does uh, hormonal uh, replacement therapy reduce blood pressure, especially in postmenopausal uh, uh, women? Uh, uh, as I know, the uh, one study showed that, uh, for example, in postmenopausal women uh, with arterial hypertension, uh, actually, hormonal replacement therapy uh, improves cycle circadian uh, blood pressure pa pattern, but unfortunately it doesn't uh, affect significantly blood pressure values and variability. So, the, and it could also inhibit age-related uh, rigid, rigidity of uh, arteries, for example, that, that therapy. Okay, and then, then last questions <laughs> for last question for, for today. Uh, also for, for uh, Hrvoja, are some uh, biomarkers uh, of vascular risk uh, gender specific? Uh -huh. From the, for example, cardiovascular biomarkers which are specific for women could be a seroplasmin, a brain natriuretic peptide, hemopexine, and leptin. On the other side, in men, we could find uh, higher higher levels of uh, myoglobulin and one specific marker, which is called C56. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Hrvoje. So uh, we should close uh, the, the today's webinar. I would like to uh, thank uh, lecturers once again for the great lessons that were very educational for me personally and I'm sure for uh, all audience. I would also like to thank all uh, listeners for, for their attention and questions and I wish you, all of you a pleasant rest of the uh, day. Many greetings from Serbia. Bye -bye. Thank you. Wonderful discussions, great presentations and questions. We thank everyone for your warm participation. And as mentioned, a webinar recording will be shared with all of you where we will do our best to fix any sound issues that there were. Um, in the meanwhile, make sure to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for upcoming educational activities. Our next webinar will take place on March 27th on the topic of a new era in cardiac rhythm monitoring post-stroke which will be a discussion between neurologists and cardiologists. We look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. And until then, take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. 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 See you.